Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, for the uh, Fall Judaic Studies lecture on uh, Is Torture Always Immoral? I, I wanted to title it Why Torture Isn't Always Immoral, but I thought that would uh, create too much controversy. It won't be able to fit people in this room. It'd be coming to... <laughs> uh, our, this is the way the program is going to work. Our first speaker, Mayor Soloveitch, I'll introduce him in a minute, uh, he'll speak for no more than 30 minutes, followed by Professor Steve Casey, and uh, who is used to speaking for 15 minutes, but we'll keep him more to 15. And uh, then Rabbi Clapper, and I'll introduce each of them before they speak, and then uh, we'll have chance, well, Rabbi Salvation can have a brief response, and we'll have questions from the audience. So let's begin. Let me tell you a little about Rabbi Soloveitchik. He's a, uh, received his rabbinical ordination from Yeshiva University. He's now a rabbi in one of the big synagogues on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. In addition to that, uh, he, I, I, meant, I wrote that he was from Yale Divinity School. It's actually Princeton Divinity School. He's already at his young age. He had a reputation for being a bit of a gadfly, which is good. Uh, looking at issues uh, more common sense than other people do. Uh, some would argue, and others would say uh, more controversially than others. A famous article on the virtue of hate is uh, one such example, which he spoke on at the university last semester. So we're very happy to have him back. And without any further ado, Rabbi Mayor Soloveitchik. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to be back here in Scranton. Um, I'll do my best to uh, uh, keep to the 30-minute deadline, so it's uh, difficult for a rabbi to do that. I'm sure uh, some of you may have heard the, uh, the, that old joke about the rabbi who was giving a sermon. He was going on and on and on and on and on, and then he apologized for speaking so long, and he said by way of explanation that he didn't have a watch. So somebody from the back of the synagogue shouted out, there's a calendar behind you. <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'll finish by midnight for sure. Um, this is my second time uh, here speaking at Scranton, uh, as uh, Mark alluded to. I spoke here originally, I had the great pleasure of speaking to the theology department before. Uh, the interesting thing is that Mark seems to only, Professor Shapiro, seems to bring me in only uh, for specific subjects. Uh, he had me first here in the religion department to speak on, to defend hate. Uh, that's what I spoke about last time. And now he has me here to defend torture. Uh, so I, next time cannibalism, I think, is what, uh, maybe is what I'll, I'll defend. But the truth is, the truth is that I, I, I do work a lot on arguing that things which people assume are always wrong are not necessarily so and indeed can often be right. Uh, Winston Churchill had a, uh, a, a line which he used to say about a, a labor uh, minister of parliament, I think it was uh, Sir Stafford Cripps, uh, Churchill used to say about him that uh, he, 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 yeah, he said, Cripps uh, has, uh, has all of the virtues I dislike and none of the vices I admire, is what he said. So I think the point of that is, is that things which are usually understood as being vices, emotions and actions, such as wrath, anger, hate, vengeance, killing, and even torture, each one of those, I think, has a proper place and can, within the right context, be virtuous. So let's begin, on that note, with the following scenario. Ethics 101. Who here took Ethics 101? Ethics 101. There will be a test afterwards. Charles Cladamer gives us the following scenario in an essay he wrote in the Weekly Standard. A terrorist has planted a nuclear bomb in New York City. It will go off in one hour. A million people will die. You capture the terrorist. You are Jack Bauer. He knows where it is. He's not talking. The question for Krauthammer is the following. Quote, if you have the slightest belief that hanging this man by his thumbs will get you the information to save a million people, are you permitted to do it? For Krauthammer, the answer is obvious. On most issues regarding torture, Krauthammer continues, I confess, tentativeness and uncertainty, but on this issue there can be no uncertainty. Not only is it permissible to hang this miscreant by his thumbs, it is a moral duty. Pope John Paul II, in his encyclical entitled Veritatis Splendor, had already considered Klauhammer's case and gave a very different answer. Reason attests, wrote the Pope in this encyclical, that there are human actions which are per se and in themselves always wrong, can never be done no matter what. 
Intrinsically evil actions for the Pope include not only homicide, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, and voluntary suicide, but also, quote, mutilation, physical and mental torture, and attempts to coerce the spirit. So for the Pope, Krauhammer fails Ethics 101, fails it egregiously, for one can never commit an evil as a means to achieving a good. And the Pope's arguments figured prominently in a symposium sponsored by the website entitled Evangelical Outpost, in which a number of Christian theologians commented on Krauthammer's essay. And though these essays may have differed in substance and style, all of them essentially condemned what Krauthammer wrote. The theologian Daryl Cole wrote that while Christianity is not a pacifist religion, still it does not believe that the responsible citizen is the citizen who does evil for a good cause. For Cole, when the terrorist is captured, he poses no further harm. To do intentional harm to a defenseless human being is a moral evil. The theologian Robert Vischer approvingly cites the Pope and explains that foremost in any framework purporting to implement this ethic is a prohibition against using our fellow humans instrumentally as a convenient means, no matter how noble. Mark Lederbeck, another theologian in a somewhat extreme and uh, considering all of the uh, recent controversy over the Passion, perhaps an inappropriate analogy when responding to uh, a well-known Jewish writer, cites uh, the example of the high priest, the high priest Caiaphas, who advocated for the killing of Jesus because, quote, it is expedient for you that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish. Writes Lederbach, we must be careful lest we forget that the Caiaphas ethic is far more dangerous than it appears. Indeed, it can even be used to justify the murder of God. Now, it is certainly an essential aspect of Jewish and Christian ethics that the ends do not justify the means. But Judaism and Christianity have always endorsed using an individual as a means toward achieving an important end in one specific case, punishing the criminal. For example, Jewish and Christian theologians have long argued that one who committed a capital crime can be killed. And one of the reasons for killing that person is to use that death as a means for deterring others. Of course, you, using the criminal as a means toward this deterrence is only permitted because through the commission of a crime the criminal has brought about a state in which society can justly inflict punishment. Deterrence itself is not enough. I can't in the name of deterrence frame Professor Shapiro and then have him executed just because of deterrence because that wouldn't be just. But, but, once the criminal deserves the punishment, then the punishment is not only an end in itself, it's also a means toward a larger end. By committing horrendous crimes that have long been held, the criminal loses his, his inviolability, and justice demands that society exact a just, a just punishment for those crimes, and can consider what other means might be achieved, what other ends might be achieved through the means of this punishment as well. Society's response can be tempered with mercy but when necessary, extreme actions can be taken. For expositors of the Christian tradition, such as Thomas Aquinas, this punishment is a form of vengeance. God has empowered the government for Aquinas to defend society by serving as God's servants and by exposing those who violate the moral law to God's wrath. This vengeance for Aquinas can take the form of capital punishment or the infliction of bodily pain maiming or bodily beating. Maiming, it should be noted, and this will be important for our discussion, um, is considered by Aquinas not only biblically warranted, but also less severe than capital punishment, reserved for less serious cases of criminality. If somebody steals something, then Aquinas feels maiming might be an appropriate, uh, might be an appropriate punishment. It's less severe than, than capital punishment. Now, Right now, maiming and any other deliberate infliction of bodily pain, torture, and so forth is considered an intrinsic evil by the Catholicism of the Catholic Church by Pope John Paul II. And some may consider this progress. After all, times change. The Church has changed since Vatican II has embraced democracy, has certainly reconsidered its attitudes towards Jews such as myself, and that's a good thing. But one can suggest that, that the Church's approach to this matter reflects the fact that when it comes to punishment, many Christian ethicists have lost all moorings to what I think, this is a funny argument from a rabbi, but what I think is the proper Christian approach. 
Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, in a written reflection on the Pope's attitude toward capital punishment, notes that John Paul II's stated belief that the death penalty is almost never permitted is in no way consistent with centuries of Catholic thought. In Scalia's wor words, the current predominant Catholic approach toward punishment is not the legacy of Aquinas, but rather, in his words, the legacy of Napoleon, Hegel, and Freud, rather than St. Paul and St. Augustine. So one could suggest, and I will be suggesting that, that the Pope's suggestion that torture is an intrinsic evil reflects the same attitude that ignores centuries of Christian tradition regarding punishment, and that a complete rejection of torture indicates an inability to understand what terrible people truly have coming to them. My presentation will argue that torture can be an appropriate action because by every just standard, those who attempt to murder millions of people actually deserve to be tortured. Terrorists do not have a right not to be tortured. Indeed, they deserve to be tormented for what they have done. Nevertheless, usually, society is entitled and often does act mercifully. And we usually refrain from meeting out what would be the deserved punishment when there is no social need for such action. But to torture a mass murderer is, I think, to act within the accords of justice in order to save the lives of innocent people. Just as one can kill a murderer in order to deter future murderers and save thereby the lives of innocent people. To declare torture an intrinsic evil when even millions of lives are at stake is to argue nowadays what for Aquinas and for centuries of Christian and Jewish ethicists would have been unfathomable that the government is not entitled to inflict bodily harm upon an evildoer in order to protect its citizens from a danger that the wicked one himself has brought about. What I want to suggest today is that to declare torture an intrinsic evil always wrong is to fail to comprehend what terrorists truly deserve and what it truly means to be subject to God's wrath. Now, usually, most of my, most of my discussions of ethics uh, is drawn from the vast writings of my own faith, Judaism. In this discussion, I will also focus to a great extent on Christian ethics, in particular on the writings of Thomas Aquinas. And the reason why this is important to me is that given the influence that Christian ethics has, rightly so, on American moral and political discourse, I want to argue why Christians can agree with my point of view as well. This is my point of view. I'm not, not, I, don't, I have no illusions that everyone will immediately agree with it, but nevertheless it is a view I, I hold strongly. Uh, I think it was Churchill himself who once, uh, when somebody was speaking in Parliament, uh, Churchill began sorrowfully nodding his head in disagreement back and forth. And the speaker saw him shaking his head back and forth, said to him, he said, Mr. Churchill, I'm merely stating my own opinion. And Churchill responded, and I am merely shaking my own head. So um, feel free to shake your head in dismay as I proceed now to justify torture, both based on the Jewish tradition and on the Christian tradition. From antiquity, Jews and Christians have insisted that there were certain acts that were intrinsically wrong and cannot be performed even to save human life, whether it's one man or a multitude that's in danger. Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theologica lists three actions that are in his view intrinsically evil and can never be done even to save innocent lives. Murder, sexual immorality, and lying. Now for Jews, the last one, I always had a big problem with that. The notion that it would be wrong to lie in order to, say, protect the Jew from the Nazis is, I think, absurd. But the Mishnah, the, the, one of the original uh, sources of Jewish law, insists that there are three sins which can never be done. In the yeshiva, in the Jewish schools where I went, these were known as the big three. Okay? So what are these? Idolatry, then sexual immorality, adultery, and or incest, and, and then murder are always wrong and never permitted. For Jewish law, these acts are yahareg va'al yavor, which means be killed and do not sin. And though the Talmud sought scriptural support for the intrinsically evil nature of adultery and idolatry, when it came to murder, they said that this, was, this needed no scriptural basis, that it was philosophically and morally obvious that one could not kill someone in order to save someone else or even a multitude of other people. 
It is a matter of logic, said one sage. Who is to say that your blood is redder than that of your fellow man? Every human being is inviolable. This is one of the axioms of Jewish Christian ethics. Every person is, is of infinite value whose life cannot be traded even for 100 others or 1 million others. Nevertheless, even as Jewish and Christian scholars insist on, in, on, on the inviolability of the human person, they also insisted on the permissibility and even at times the duty of ending the lives of egregious evildoers. It is in the Bible one of the first post-Diluvian proclamations. He who sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed. The reason given by the Bible, the value of the poor creature killed. For in the image of God he created man. Hebrew scripture's acceptance of just punishment and of capital punishment is incontrovertible. As Avery Cardinal Dulles has noted, the Mosaic Law quote specifies no less than 36 capital offenses calling for execution by stoning, burning, decapitation, and strangulation. It doesn't mean that it was meted out often, necessarily, but the possibility is there. Here, the objective importance of just retribution is stressed by the Bible. When it comes to punishment, the Bible says, why ought one to kill a criminal? The evildoer should be destroyed, eradicated from your midst. There is an objective importance in punishment. At the same time, the Pentateuch also insists that punishment is not only an end in itself, but also a means to, the, to another end. All Israel will see and hear the punishment, we are told in Deuteronomy, and they will not sin again. So here we're introduced to the idea of punishment as deterrent and protection. The notion that punishment allows us to consider not only the justice of the punishment itself, but also its utility. Now, of course, Christians could claim that they reject this entirely. That after the Passion, man's sins have found their atonement for Christian theology. Christ has been crucified, the temple tapestry torn, a law of love is now in effect, and perhaps everything that Hebrew scripture says for Christians about punishment is not normative in any way. But for Thomas Aquinas and for our own discussion, the critical passage in Christian scripture can be found in Romans, in which Paul describes the government as acting as God's representative in punishing evildoers. He says, If thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Now, for Aquinas, what's critical to an understanding of this passage is not only Paul's obvious approval of bearing the sword, and we all know what bearing the sword means, more on that in a moment. Also, important for Aquinas is the, is the apostle's explanation for why the sword is wielded. The executioner is, in his words, a revenger. In other words, capital punishment is a form of permitted vengeance. And though the Bible tells us that we're not supposed to commit vengeance, that Aquinas says, and here he's quite right, that that only refers to personal and petty vengeance. And this the Jewish tradition has long stressed. But to vengeance as a form of justly deserved punishment, then in Aquinas' words, and I quite agree, vengeance may be lawful. But... If every human being, as I just said, is created in the image of God and, and is inviolable, then what justifies the killing of a criminal? Aquinas himself asked this question. And he answers in the Summa that by sinning, man departs from the order of reason and consequently falls away from the dignity of his manhood insofar as he is naturally free. As such, he falls into the slavish state of the beast by being disposed of according as he is useful to others. In other words... Aquinas says that by acting like an animal, human beings lose their rights of inviolability. And therefore their lives can be eliminated, and in the process of being eliminated, that punishment can be utilized as a means towards another end. Now this striking statement by Aquinas has provoked any number of modern commentators. So for example, John Finnis of Oxford, a well-known writer on Aquinas, is very much perturbed by what Aquinas says that one can kill a terrible criminal because by committing the crime he loses his right of inviolability. He notes that Aquinas himself believes that criminals have some rights, that we're supposed to love criminals, even evildoers are supposed to love. So how could Aquinas say that? So Finnis suggests 
that really Aquinas is wrong and reflecting a strong uh, line of thought in Catholic thought today, including that of the Pope, he suggests that really perhaps capital punishment is not right. The question then, of course, is how then could Paul speak of the vengeance which is achieved by wielding the wrath of the sword, the wrath, of, uh, the, wrath achi- uh, the uh, punishment as a manifestation of wrath by wielding the sword, that, Finna says, punishment as retribution can be made manifest through government enforced imprisonment. And that's the, uh, a strong line of Catholic thought as we know it today. Paul authorizes the government to bear the sword. What does that mean? Bearing the sword for Finnis perhaps means that one, we can imprison criminals and if they resist, we can use the sword to enforce this and to enforce that imprisonment. Now there are two problems with this notion. First, one can interpret the phrase the power of the sword as referring to self-defense and imprisonment, but only if one ignores the rest of Paul's sentence. Paul clearly indicates, as Aquinas notes quite well, that punishment is an expression of wrath. As Antonin Scalia notes, to think that Paul meant that the sword is to be used for rounding up the naughty miscreants so that the wrath of jail time, or perhaps a fine, can be executed upon them, can only be considered absurd. Second, to reject the death penalty as immoral because it involves the directly intended harming and killing of another human being is a rejection of centuries of Christian tradition and of the Bible itself. It's not only Aquinas who is willing to denounce murder while simultaneously embracing capital punishment. As Dulles notes, the fathers and doctors of the church are virtually unanimous in their support of capital punishment. The very same Augustine that insisted against murder as a means also insisted in the city of God that capital punishment was not murder. And I would add, well, and Dulles continues that from Augustine to Pius XII, the state in inflicting bodily harm upon a criminal does not assume the power to abrogate another's inviolability. It's not the state that's announcing that we're taking away rights from this human being. The criminal Christian tradition has always insisted by acting horribly has lost his right through his own actions has lost his right of inviolability. In Dulles' words, the Christian tradition recognizes that the criminal by a kind of moral suicide has deprived himself of the right to life. And I would add that this assumption is fully consistent with both the biblical and the Talmudic tradition. We note, for example, the prophet Samuel's words in executing the wicked Amalekite king Agag in the rabbi's description a very, very painful and slow death. Says Shmuel, says Samuel, just as you have made many, many mothers childless, so now shall your mother be childless. And the Talmud also has a similar phrase in discussing uh, criminals who act with uh, immoral abandon. In the Talmud's words, they are hifkir atzman lamisa, they are, as it were, remove their own claim to their lives, their own rights that they have to their lives. Now, with this in mind, we're able to examine if and when torture can ever be permitted, even obligatory. Now, people say often that torture is purely hypothetical. All the cases you have in Christian Ethics 101 or Jewish Ethics 101. This is a real case. The case was given by Krauthammer in his piece. Quote, let's take an example that is far from hypothetical. You capture Khalid Sheikh Mohammed in Pakistan. He not only has killed innocents, he is deeply involved in the planning of the present and future killing of innocents. This we know. We know this with certainty. He not only was the architect of the 9-11 attack, but also as the top Al-Qaeda planner and logistical expert, he also knows a lot about terror attacks to come. He knows plans, identities, contacts, materials, cell locations, safe houses, case targets. This is not an episode of 24. This is a real case. What do you do with him? So, here we have a man. Let's consider this for a moment. A man who has been found by the United States government to be a known criminal. If you like, such a determination can be made by a military court. Now suppose this court 
ordered the NSA, instead of executing Mohammed for his crimes, suppose this military court ordered the NSA to torture Mohammed in order to extract information. Would this torture be unjust? Is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed undeserving of being made to feel excruciating pain? Krauthammer writes that a terrorist is entitled to nothing. Quote, anyone who blows up a car bomb in a market deserves to spend the rest of his life roasting on a spit over an open fire. The reason, Krauthammer writes, that we do not always torture the terrorist is not because he doesn't deserve it. He does deserve it. We don't always torture a terrorist because of who we are, not because of who he is. We don't do that, Krauthammer writes, because we do not usually, because unlike him, we are civilized. No one can deny, Krauthammer adds, how corrupting torture can be to the individuals and societies that practice it. In other words, we refuse usually to torture terrorists or mass murderers, not because of what it would do to the terrorists, who richly deserves to be tortured, but rather because of what it would do to us. For though society is entitled to make manifest the wrath of God in the form of physical punishment, this power is subject to their discretion. As we have noted, punishment is an end in itself, as well as a means. Its primary purpose is retribution, but it's also meant to serve the secondary purposes of rehabilitation, deterrence, and protection. So we temper our own justice with mercy often, depending on these needs, depending on the needs of society, depending on whether the justly punished criminal can be utilized as a means to a proper end. And this point is made by Aquinas himself as well. In discussing sins committed by an entire community, Aquinas notes that scripture seems to indicate that only certain members of society ought to be punished. On the other hand, in other instances, God releases his wrath upon entire cities, such as Sodom and Gomorrah. Aquinas answers that depending on the need, the extent of the punishment can vary. When the whole multitude sins, he writes, vengeance must be taken on them. Sometimes, however, if there's hope of many making amends, then the severity of vengeance should be brought to bear on a few of the principles, whose punishment fills the rest with fear. So justice, in other words, is tempered with mercy, but only at times. If the desired ends can be achieved with a limited punishment, then mercy can be appropriate. But if severity is called for, then it is severity that must be chosen. If it would be more damaging to the social order to bring about vengeance upon a criminal, and if society can be protected through a less severe punishment than torture or capital punishment, then perhaps we are to refrain from vengeance. But when millions of lives hang in the balance, and the infliction of severe pain is the only way of protecting the social order, then we torture the terrorist until critical information is procured and society is saved. And then, we can be, and then we can afford to be merciful once more. The torture of a terrorist is permitted because it is a form of punishment. In times of great need, we mete out to the terrorist what he deserves in order to procure for society the safety that it deserves. So what are the arguments against torture? Why am I wrong? The argument against torture, as far as I can tell, put forward by Jewish and Christian theologians who would disagree with me and think what I'm arguing is quite horrible, seem to be as follows. First, one might argue that even though capital punishment, execution of a criminal, is long established as moral in Jewish or Christian ethics, perhaps torture is worse than that that even were we to condone execution, nevertheless the infliction of intense physical pain is worse than capital punishment, and never a proper penalty. This, it would seem, is the current position of the Catholic Church, whose Catholicism allows for the rare possibility of capital punishment when deterrence requires it, but rules out torture as inherently immoral, exceptionally wrong, always wrong. Torture writes the Catholicism, which uses physical or moral violence to extract confessions, punish the guilty, frighten opponents, or satisfy hatred, is contrary to respect for the persons and for human dignity. For the Catholicism, 
Causing bodily harm is worse than killing him. And this is, in today's day and age, an unsurprising point of view. But it is also contrary to both Jewish and Christian traditions. The Bible reserves execution for the most severe crimes, but endorses the possibility of infliction of bodily pain for lesser crimes. Noteworthy is the biblical punishment of flogging, the infliction of 40 lashes, which would be undoubtedly considered torture by the Catholic That maiming can be in accordance with justice can also be seen from the opening story in the book of Judges, in which the Israelites capture the wicked king Adoni Bezek. Scripture writes as follows. Adoni Bezek fled, but they chased after him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Then Adoni Bezek said, he said, this is just. Seventy kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off have picked up scraps under my table. Now God has paid me back for what I did to them. It's therefore unsurprising that Aquinas, in his endorsement of justly deserved execution, has no problem with justly deserved naming. Interestingly, the Talmud itself insisted that even when, when scripture says an eye for an eye, it's not to be interpreted literally, usually, and instead monetary payment must be made. But on passages such as these about Adoni Bezek, Aquinas himself justified the possibility of maiming, and it never ever occurred to him that the infliction of bodily pain while keeping somebody alive is more severe and worse of a punishment than killing somebody. So what is the rationale behind this assumption? The idea that society, that a society willing to kill someone but still refrain from torture. One argument that has answered this question was penned by Andrew Sullivan in a New Republic uh, essay responding to Krauthammer. In his essay entitled The Abolition of Torture, Sullivan attempts to explain why inflicting bodily harm upon criminals is worse than killing them. And he says as follows, Torture is the polar opposite of freedom. It is the banishment of all freedom from a human body and soul insofar as that is possible. It takes what is animal in us and deploys it against us, and deploys it against what makes us human. Now this is a perfectly respectable reason to oppose torture, as long as one is willing to oppose all forms of capital punishment as well. But to argue, as Sullivan does, based on this reasoning, that torture is worse than capital punishment, that torture is intrinsically evil while capital punishment is not, is bizarre. For nothing more profoundly affects man's freedom than his being killed. Nothing comes between body and soul more permanently than death. As another writer, Jonah Goldberg, put it, reflecting on Andrew Sullivan's essay, by this own formulation, death is more of a polar opposite of freedom than torture. Death is forever. Will returns. But Andrew isn't against killing our enemies. Why? The dirt map, I think that means death, offers no opportunity for redemption, no opportunity for future freedom. So much for the first argument against torture. Another argument against torture put forward is that it is ineffective and therefore futile. It is often said that the state of Israel, where this question is all too relevant, considers torture unhelpful. But this, as Charles Kronhammer has noted, is not true. After the second Palestinian uprising broke out a year, uh, 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 broke out, he writes, and especially after a devastating series of suicide bombings and passenger buses, here he's quoting a report of the Washington Post, Israel's inter internal security service known as the Shin Bet returned to physical coercion as a standard practice. Moreover, continues Sullivan, the thing about torture is that sometimes it does work. In 1994, 19-year-old Israeli corporal Nachshon Waxman was kidnapped by Palestinian terrorists. The Israelis captured the driver of the car used in the kidnapping and tortured him in order to find where Waxman was being held. Prime Minister Robin, Prime Minister and Peacemaker, admitted that they tortured him in a way that went uh, beyond what is usually considered coercive interrogation. And the driver talked. And his information was accurate. The Israelis found Waxman. Continues Krauthammer, in the Waxman case, I would have done precisely what Robin did and faced with a similar choice, an American president would have a similar obligation. To do otherwise, Krauthammer concludes, to give up the chance to find your soldier, lest you sully yourself by authorizing torture of the person who possesses potentially life-saving information, is a deeply immoral betrayal of a soldier and country. 
Third, the worst argument employed against torture is that because torture is so often used by evildoers for evil means, therefore, anyone who tortures is akin to these miscreants. According to this argument, and you see this argument all the time, our torturing the terrorists would be going down to their moral level. Andrew Sullivan, when at his most hysterical, has been the worst offender in this regard, describing waterboarding as, uh, since it was something used by the Inquisition, he describes waterboarding as something like Torquemada approved waterboarding. Sounds like an advertisement. Try waterboarding, Torquemada approved. As if the very fact that the Inquisition or the Soviets made use of torture on innocent people means that it's wrong to torture actual evildoers. Now I call this argument the worst one because it is relativistic to the core and embodies moral equivalence of the first water. The fact that people have committed injustices in no way implies that the actions that they utilize are always immoral. Sullivan does, does believe that war can be just. He supported the Iraq War. The Germans waged war on Poland. He no doubt let me finish him. He no doubt believes that in placing criminals in jail he no doubt believes in placing criminals in jail, Soviets and prison people. One could just as easily assert that Andrew Sullivan approves of Nazi approved killing and Stalin endorsed imprisonment. There's an old joke about uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was asked to describe the state of the Soviet economy in one word. Good, Gorbachev says. Gorbachev has been asked to describe the state of the Soviet economy in two words. Mmm, not good, he says. <laughs> this argument is similarly relativistic. As Jonah Goldberg writes, my friend Andrew Sullivan's moral absolutism has led him to make sweeping comparisons between captured al-Qaeda terrorists and dissidents in totalitarian regimes, as if one Solzhenitsyn equals one Zarqawi. And Goldberg's point is that to argue that the torture of terrorists is wrong because the torture of Solzhenitsyn is wrong is to place terrorists and heroic dissidents on the same level. It is terrible moral equivalence. But the unwillingness of some Christians and Jews to accept that some people actually do deserve such a punishment, do actually deserve to be tortured, do actually deserve an intense physical affliction. The fact that they refuse to believe this reveals that many people are all too willing to place the egregiously evil on the same level as others. And this attitude, I think, can also be detected in, and with this final point I'll conclude, in the evolution of the, at least the Catholic interpretation, of the doctrine of hell. Christians long believed that hell was a place where God deliberately inflicted pain upon those who deserved it. Evildoers were tortured in hell. One thinks, of course, of the excellent Far Side cartoon in which you see people in hell saying to one another, wow, even the coffee is cold here. They thought of everything. <laughs> now, however, the Catholic Church has grown uncomfortable with any discussion of justifiable eternal torment. In a famous 1999 public audience, Pope John Paul II admitted that though scripture describes hell as a place, quote, of eternal suffering, with no possibility of return nor the alleviation of pain, he argued that any interpretation of hellfire as a form of actually divinely inflicted pain is a misinterpretation. And the Pope further suggested, going very, very far beyond what other theologians long believe, that perhaps no one actually is eternally damned. Perhaps we can hope that everyone, even Hitler, somehow makes it to heaven. So this is a current, a current attitude within the great church theologians toward damnation. Gone is the anxiety of eternal torment as a punishment for wickedness. Gone is the traditional notion of God as the divine and just punisher and torturer. And gone as well as our conviction that some people truly deserve to be in hell and belong there. So with that in mind, that a belief that torture is always wrong is quite understandable. If God would not punish, if even God would not torture Hitler for an eternity, then it stands the reason that we can't torture a run-of-the-mill terrorist. In his discourse against intrinsically evil actions, Pope John Paul in a footnote quotes Paul VI, and he writes as follows. Far be it from Christians to be led to embrace another opinion, as if the council taught that nowadays some things are permitted 
which the church had previously declared intrinsically evil. Who does not see in this the rise of a depraved moral relativism, one that clearly endangers the church's entire doctrinal heritage? But I think that in declaring torture and maiming intrinsically evil, the church and all Jewish and Christian ethicists who agree with that position are doing the reverse arguing that an action is intrinsically evil even as Jewish and Christian tradition has for centuries endorsed such actions when necessary for the protection of society. Now, I say all this as a Jew who has tremendous appreciation for the important role that Pope John Paul played in the world and the role that the church plays in the world and all the good that it can accomplish. Over the past half century, the Catholic Church has been a fearless spokesman for the value of human life in its opposition to abortion, cloning, and euthanasia. The Pope himself is a hero of the Cold War and helped bring down communism. But in the attitude toward the evildoer, toward the tyrant, toward the terrorist, the current approach embodies not the wisdom of the ages, but the moral equivalent of secular Europe. One can only hope that Benedict XVI, along with Christian and Jewish ethicists, other Christian and Jewish ethicists, ethicists, will reacquaint those who are ready to surrender to evil with the traditional concept of God's wrath and with our human responsibility of acting as God's messengers in visiting pain and suffering upon those who wish to visit pain and suffering upon us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for that uh, very challenging paper. I forgot one of the Gone. Gone is purgatory also. Huh? Gone is purgatory. No, limbo. Limbo, 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 yeah. Uh, now we're going to have a two, as I said, two brief responses. Uh, first, our very own Professor Casey in the theology department uh, teaches ethics. And uh, without further ado, Professor Casey. Now that my friend Mark is away from the podium, I can say I'm going to take a couple of minutes at the beginning to make a couple of comments. One is to thank him for the marvelous way that he's run the Judaic Studies program over uh, a number of years. I think he has shepherded it along beautifully. The second thing is we're in the Harry and Jeanette Weinberg Library. And I think that's significant and we ought to note it. They made this building possible. But what you don't perhaps know is that one million dollars of money went to the Judaic Studies program, right, which helps fund all of these things. So I think we give a little bow to that as well. And by the way, if you have any donations, I'm sure you can see the director of the development on the way out. Right? Why did they do this? Uh, in the interest of advancing the study of Judaism on a Catholic campus, a campus that when the Jesuits arrived here had a substantial Jewish presence. It was a small school but it had a lot of local Jews here. That would be in the summer of 1942. All right, having given my pitch, Meyer, I have to thank you for a very creative interpretation of the tradition. I would say it was provocative and interesting, and I can only use that word interesting in the way that Winston Churchill used to use it when he was out on the, uh, on the trail at campaign time, uh, when he had a baby, you know, those little babies. Do you think I should step closer to that? I'm trying to avoid it, actually, because I have a habit of blowing you out. So if something goes wrong, do this, okay? Um, and, you know, they gave him all those babies that he was supposed to kiss. He's a very interesting baby, ma'am. <laughs> we have a dicey history of our relationship in the Catholic Church with torture. And let's make that clear from the beginning. Not in our earliest period. In the period of the gospel, I'm going to hold things down here. In the period of the gospel and immediate gospel church, this was not an issue. The church was pacifist. It was not engaged with the state, and these issues never arose. Interestingly enough, to comment on something Meyer mentioned, there is considerable ambivalence in the scripture towards the state. I was glad that you picked out the appropriate place right, to lay your weight there, because other places the state is viewed as demonic. And I think we ought to keep that in the back of our heads. So you say to me, but hey, that isn't the whole thing. Yes, after 300, things change rapidly. The word change, by the way, I wish to come back to. We find church and state hand in glove. And the Roman Catholic Church begins to approve of capital punishment, justified war, crusades later on, 
and, of course, torture. That includes, by the way, the conversos in Spain during the Inquisition. It includes Christian heretics uh, in Europe and some other places and so on later on. This parallels a rather dramatic change in the church's attitude towards war, starting with pacifism to a constrained just war, to a very slippery path of just war that ends up in crusades. I wish to talk very much about the period 1960 or so on, but let me indicate to you that we have problems with the issue of torture presently. And I'm not talking about in the United States, I'm talking about places like the Dirty War in Argentina, where we have military officers who are confessing Catholics, where we have a priest participating in this, people who are in some ways reversing the decisions of the Second Vatican Council in their actions, and certainly the popes who follow. Okay, let's talk a little bit about something in this point that I want to make here. The punishment of the evildoer in that middle period between 300 and, say, the middle of the 20th century, right, when approbation for torture was fine, was used to secure information. Indeed, I understand from a guest that we brought in, it was, quote, the pursuit of truth that prompted the Spanish Inquisition to the various interesting forms of torture, like Churchill again. Uh, I would suggest to you we might want to keep that in the back of our head as a parallel to the present. Is that what we're seeking, is information and truth? I'll be back to that. The tradition then, Roman Catholic tradition then, has development. We've mixed scripture and available wisdom for the most of the history of the church. Not the very earliest, but certainly when someone like Augustine or Aquinas is dealing with moral questions, they are not dealing solely with scripture. I would suggest to you that this invites development. Now let's go a little bit further. The current catechism suggests that capital punishment is prohibited. Interestingly, how did they remove capital punishment, which is, the rabbi points out very carefully, was there for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. The statement indicates that only absolute necessity would make it allowable for us to have capital punishment. Hence, there are very rare and if not non-existent conditions in which capital punishment would be applied. I agree with him, by the way, there's a lot of Catholics that don't agree with this. Particularly those two theologians you kept talking about there, Krauthammer and Scalia, right? Okay, may I go a little further? The question of vengeance is not present in the conversation from Vatican II on. The question of punishment is something else, and obviously they regard punishment as being the isolation of the guilty party and so on. What else changed? Well, you noted it. The document on religious freedom in the Second Vatican Council, the thinking of which began right about this day in 1963, yes, and finished with a document, Dignitatis Humanae Personae, in 1965. A substantial move forward that I suspect some of my fellow religionists still regret. I don't, and certainly the mind of the church doesn't. So what happened in post-Vatican II? Other changes. It is interesting to observe a considerable interest in human rights, something that the Catholic Church was not known for before that. The virtue of solidarity. Right? John Paul II is very well known for this. But if you were to look up the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Catholic Church, published in 04, you would see numerous references to that including, by the way, on the subject of terrorism, war, internment of people without end, and so on. Are they thinking of Guantanamo? I don't know. So peace to Antonin Scalia. We are really discussing 40 years of Catholic social teaching. Not merely John Paul II, but also John, John XXIII, Paul VI, bishops' councils, excuse me, conferences and synods, one after another. We see whether he is discussing with international leaders or with Catholic groups, such things as the Sacrament of Reconciliation, John Paul II repeatedly suggesting attacks on solidarity shatter the world 
at its very foundations. Torture would. I just want to do a little sidestep, and you'll see in a moment how these things sort of fit together. The alternate tradition, I'm thinking of things like the Geneva Conventions, built on just war doctrine, mandated by what is sometimes called in books the New International Law, that was in the 1700s, right, rose out of religious traditions, the wars of religion, and the rise of the modern state. What I find interesting about that is that this particular tradition resonates clearly with the Catholic tradition since the 1960s. And yes, the common Article 3, supported by such notorious left-wingers as Senator McCain, right, uh, would stand right there. Now, why does the military not want torture? Let's talk a little bit about kinds of reasoning. As the rabbi suggested, a good deal of the material that we find, and I'm talking here about the catechism, the uh, compendium, and so on, is actually deontological reasoning. Let me apologize. Um, I'm a teacher, and I always stop to explain what some of these words mean, and I'm probably patronizing a large number of you. But it comes from the Greek word deos, which talks about rule. And most of this reasoning is based in a theory of duty and moral obligation. To put it another way, it's non-negotiable kinds of things in the street. Deductive reasoning. If you look carefully in the catechism, you find, as you appropriately mentioned, the question of defense, the common good. But you also find what I was talking about in regards to capital punishment. And if you look at 2297, there's a test on this next time, so get the numbers down, right? You will find comments about torture and terrorism, both of which are paralleled and both of which are prohibited. That's not the only way of doing reasoning, and I know I can be quickly accused of being the lawyer that says, my client is not guilty. If my client is guilty, my client is not guilty the way you thought my client was guilty, right? But I will talk about casuistry on the other side, the practical case-oriented type of operation that we could call casuistry. It's practical. Sometimes it even sounds utilitarian which is a dirty word in both of our traditions, I think, sometimes, right? I would like to make a couple of points about moral assessment here. In casuistry, or whatever you want to call it, utilitarian approach, I would suggest, contrary to what the rabbi says, structure is counterproductive. Curiously enough, Richard Cohen in the uh, Guardian Weekly at one point put, torture is a beast with a rapacious appetite. I see, it seems to me it is very difficult to prevent abuse and expansion of torture. Once these warrants that we put up are tested, they slip until finally we have virtually warrantless kinds of actions. And this was certainly seen in Latin America in the last 30 or 40 years. I would like you to entertain, along with Aristotle, who was a good friend of Thomas Aquinas's, right? that when torture becomes a habit, there's more torture. And habit is the issue. Common good disappears. One another step. Are there other effective means present to get the, quote, information, end quote, we're seeking? I remind you that the church said there was another way to handle capital punishment. I also remind you that if you look carefully in the paper over the last two or three years, or on the television, you know that the CIA and the FBI are having a furious battle over how to get information from the people that they capture. The consequences of taking some of the CIA measures can be found in a number of things, including the 1% Doctrine, which I must admit I read with considerable intrigue. Very interesting book, Ron Suskind. And no, I don't know him, and I'm not getting a, a side pay. I want to make one last comment. For Christians, there is, and for Jews too, by the way, I'm not excluding here, there is a very important consideration when we're talking about the use of torture. We have an issue of what happens, quote, when we're done. Or to put it another way, what do you do about reconciliation? Wars are bad enough. Torture is worse. 
I want you to think about the fact that around the world there are considerable numbers of groups, often called truth and reconciliation commissions, trying to solve these problems, some moderately successfully, some not at all. South Africa, South America, particularly places like Argentina, Timor, etc. The question I'm asking is, where do we go after the war when the war consisted in lots of torture? In the Christian ethics field, there's a discussion currently of just peacemaking, an additional area when we start talking about the ethics of violence. One more comment, if we will. I would like to separate the actions of the Almighty from the actions of the civil society, my period. Okay, then I will go on after that. Um, the theologian, uh, George Lopez, he's out at the University of Notre Dame, says we should be very careful. He said this on the event, on the, this year's anniversary of 9-11, to avoid the ethics of Dirty Harry. And I think I want you to think exactly there. I know college students never have any time to go to movies, so they don't see any Dirty Harry movies, but, you know, you get the idea, right? What does he mean? He says we depart from normal ethical restraints to use means that will protect, excuse me, will protect us from additional attacks, and in the process, end up flipping the whole means and consideration that we started with. Hmm. J. Glenn Gray, in a classic now called The Warriors, 1959, a World War II soldier, all over Europe for I think four years, right? A teacher of philosophy when he came back commented that we have to preserve our nerve. He said the problem, and this is true as it was in 1959, is that we're starting an ar a cycle of armed peace, quote unquote, which actually of course isn't peace at all. We prefer to perish by caution rather than taking the past path of risk for genuine peace. So sometimes we have to carefully, and I say carefully, engage the situation in which we take risks for peace. Susskind makes a very good case in his book that going totally out to attempt to stop all attacks often produces the opposite. So what's Gray saying? There we go. May I make one last comment to those of us who are in schools and so on. In all places, on the back of the Chronicle of Higher Education, for those of you who don't know it, it's a trade journal, if you will, a man by the name of Andrew Salvas, AHL, uh, in November of 05 last year, a professor of public policy at UCLLA, commented, and I'll just give you the title of the article on this whole conversation, and Mr. Krauthammer too, by the way. The title of the article reads, Torture as a Case Study how to corrupt your students. And I don't need to go any further. Thanks. Thank you, Meyer. Thank you very much, Professor Casey. And as uh, for, our, as for those who came in late, uh, Rabbi Cla uh, Clapper will speak for about 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll have questions and answers. And during the questions and answers to anyone, uh, Rabbi Salvatore will have a chance to reply uh, also. So uh, let me Rabbi Clapper, a number of years rabbi at the uh, Harvard Hillel, now at Don Academy and runs a summer institute in Boston for advanced Talmudic uh, studies. Uh, we're very happy you came from Boston today. We're very happy to have you and take it away. Okay. I want to uh thank Dr. Shapiro very much for inviting me. Um, unlike Rabbi Soloveitchik and Professor Casey, I don't think I can speak authoritatively for the Christian tradition. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I want to begin uh, by telling a few stories, um, the last of which I hope will um, resonate very much um, both out of Jewish and Christian tradition. Uh, the Talmud tells a number of stories about rabbis who experience uh, tremendous physical pain, 
Um, in one case, that of Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion, who is um, being roasted fully over an open spit, um, he in fact decides that death is better than that. Uh, another case, that of Rabbi Judah the Prince, um, his maidservant decides, that with, with the later approval of the, uh, at least the editor of the Talmud, that death is better for him than the lingering illness he has. So I think that, first of all, we have to acknowledge, um, at least rabbinic tradition, admit that there are fates worse than death. Um, we can then decide whether specific instances of torture meet that criteria. But there are in fact fates, there are in fact fates worse than death, and this is critical in the contemporary discussion about end of life issues. Um, but the story I really want to focus on is the death of Rabbi Akiva, uh, one of the great Talmudic sages. Rabbi Akiva um, dies in a, um, a means not yet utilized by the CIA, uh, by having his, by having, by having his uh, flesh, his flesh um, played off with hot combs. Um, at the, um, now, the Talmud has this sort of um, time travel science fiction scene in which God shows the death of Rabbi Akiva to Moses. Uh, and Moses' reaction is horror. And he turns to God and he says, this is you know, Rabbi Akiva, great sage, this is Torah, and this is its reward. And God gives a reply which initially seems highly opaque. God tells Moses, be silent because thus it arose before me. What does that mean, thus it arose before me? Um, so the 20th century um, Orthodox Jewish ethicist, Rabbi Leo Dessler, gives what I think is a brilliant interpretation of this. He says there is another place in rabbinic literature where something is referred to as coming up before God. And the very, in the beginning of the creation of the world, um, we are told that God intended to create the world with justice, pure justice. But he saw the world could not survive. So he joined justice to mercy. And that's our world. And this is um, the rabbi's explanation as to why the names of God are different in the first and second chapters of Genesis. Because the first chapter of Genesis is the, the way the world would have been had, it just, had God only created it with justice. The second chapter describes the real world in which mercy and justice are combined. So the death list says that um, really all human beings should seek to live in a world of strict justice. Because the world of strict justice is one in which we are wholly accountable for our actions. Mercy deprives us of dignity because there are actions right, which are simply forgiven. We can't be held accountable for them. Rabbi Akiva was given the opportunity to live in such a world, a world of strict justice. But in the world of strict justice, unadulterated with mercy, everyone deserves to be played alive because we owe everything to God. So I'm extremely nervous about arguments which are predicated on the assumption that we can do things to people because they deserve them. Um, for example, right, as the Rizalitri points out, there are no fewer than 26 crimes for which the, right, for which the Torah prescribed the death penalty. Are we willing to, for example, torture adulterers um, in order to, right, um, to get information? Um, <laughs> right? I, I, you know, I, I, think, right, I think there are many for We can go through the list, the list of crimes. And so the notion that we can engage in... Um, that we can engage in independent judgments aside from our, the traditionally mandated penalties as to what punishments we can inflict strikes me as tremendously dangerous. But it might be that even the punishments ordered in the, uh, in the Torah are reflective of mercy. And really it might be that people, for example, who are willing and willing together deserve to be maimed. And therefore, if information is necessary, we should be able to maim them. Um, right? I think it's very, very important that we restrict penalties specifically to those that are, that are legally permitted. And I want to put this in a broader context. Um, all right, so let's just point out, um, I think, compellingly in, in many cases, that there are people who have forfeited their right to life and possibly their right to be treated with any modicum of dignity. Um, so there is a, a, um, a trope which I'm not sure I always agree with, but um, I'll make use of here. Uh, which is that regards that. Well, so usually the distinction is made between Christianity and Judaism on this axis. So I don't presume to speak for Christianity. Um, but Judaism at least is a religion in which duties occupy as, as important a place as rights. And so the question is not so much whether someone has forfeited their right to life and dignity, but whether we still owe them a duty right, to preserve their life and treat their dignity. In this regard, um, I think that the halakha is quite clear that even, right, that even criminals, even the worst criminals, still are owed duties. They're owed duties of burial. Uh, they're, owed duty, they're owed duties of being, of being executed and released. 
by the least severe way, even those who are subjected to flogging may not be subjected to one more lash. Right, then, it's, right, then it's judicially mandated. Um, the notion that because someone is a criminal and deserves punishment, that therefore they have forfeited all rights, maybe. But just because they have forfeited all rights does not mean that we, have, that we no longer have duties towards them. Okay, but even this argument being accepted does not lead us to the conclusion that torture is always wrong. Um, and I should begin by saying that it's not clear to me that Jewish law believes that there is any such thing as something which is always wrong with the possible exception of idolatry. Um, even adultery might perhaps be permitted to save large groups of people as opposed to individual people. And certainly, right, and certainly killing is permitted, um, right, killing somebody who is threatening someone else is not only permitted but mandatory. Um, and it might be argued, not unreasonably, that if it is permitted to kill somebody who is, right, who is menacing someone else with death, then as we would say in the Jewish tradition, call the Homer, all the more so, um, it should be permitted to torture them. Now there is, so far as I am aware, no explicit discussion of torture as such in, um, in Jewish tradition. And we have to acknowledge up front that definitions of torture are socially dependent. The things which are considered, you know, as with cruel and unusual punishment, and um, which I think, um, with apologies to Justice Scalia, whom I often do agree with, uh, I think cruel and unusual punishment is a category that clearly has to, um, has to change societally. Um, the only discussion that I'm aware of is the um, late 18th, early 19th century rabbi Jacob Etlinger, who makes the really radical claim that while it is permitted to kill someone who is menacing someone else, it is not permitted to utterly deprive them of their dignity. Uh, and he actually takes the position that somebody you could shoot, you could not humiliate publicly. Now, I'm not sure I'm willing to go that far, uh, but at least raises the possibility in Jewish tradition that, um, right, that torture is right, torture defined as treating human being in a way which utterly deprives them of dignity is, um, is worse than death. Um, but I would not wish to make my argument depend on that because I think that's um, a highly questionable um, extension of the tradition. The tradition says that humiliating someone publicly is tantamount to murder. Um, saying it's worse than murder is novel. Um, I do, though, want to address, um, I think, the, the issue that that it actually brings up and really needs to be taken on head on is what he refers to as the Ethics 101 case, um, the case that Charles Krauthammer brought, brought up, um, the case that fundamentally all, um, all advocates of all horrible things want to do eventually bring up, which is to say, right, if you had a choice between committing this horrible thing and saving a million people from dying from, from dying from the nuclear weapon, and we could make it worse, right? You could do this horrible thing or save a million people from roasting slowly over open spit. Uh, right, or in the, uh, in the tradition of religious coercion, you can do this terrible thing or save a million people from burning in hell forever. Um, right, so, right, so don't the ends justify the means? And after all, and I accept this, right, that if the ends don't justify the means, what would? Um, right, and I don't think Jewish tradition um, agrees that one can never commit an evil to do a good. Um, if it accomplishes a greater good, then it wasn't an evil, largely. Um, but um, I do think that there are a number of points that have to be made in this. Uh, one is that one does always have to be tremendously careful to consider the effect on one's own soul of making such decisions. Um, and the Jewish tradition has numerous examples of people who did the right thing and for the sake of a greater good and their souls were, were nonetheless damaged. So one always has to be, one always has to be careful um, to consider the consequences. But I don't even want to go there to defend it because I would agree that if, there was, if I could save a million people from dying in a nuclear war, and the result was that my soul were slightly damaged, that the, it might very well be my moral duty to sacrifice my soul for the sake of those million people. Um, but the question, but um, let's take the Krauthammer case. Let's begin um, by setting, Krauthammer set up the case in a way which is designed to throw a lot of images at you and get you to agree this case is obvious. He takes Khalid Muhammad who is, um, right, who is presumed to be the worst, the mastermind of the worst terrorist attack in, right, in, recent, in recent memory, right, and you presume that you know this absolutely, right, and you presume that he had, and, right, and you know that he has information about planned attacks, and you know that you cannot prevent these attacks any other way, right, and you're going to engage in the, in the, in the, um, in the process of waterboarding 
to get this information, and you will discover and you will discover that this information is in fact true, um, right? And you won't waste your efforts tracing down the false leads because he's already planned how to respond to torture by sending you to efforts which will waste all your agents for years and years and years. And as all say that now, first of all, I would argue if we're using an ends justify the means, I don't think Krauthammer has really the slightest interest in Rabbi Soloveitchik's argument. This is about retribution. Um, because the truth is, let's suppose Khalid Muhammad had not yet planned the 9-11 action. So Khalid Muhammad was only planning to have this nuclear bomb go off. He has not yet committed any crime at all, except conspiracy. In neither Jewish nor Catholic tradition, right, can he be, right, can he be subjected to any punishment whatsoever, which is not immediately designed to save those lives. Right? It's not a question of what he deserves. Um, or let's suppose that, in fact, the information, right, that, in fact, um, Khalid Muhammad put this information um, in a way where it's encoded in, it's encoded in somebody's DNA in a way which you can only extract it, right, by killing the person. Right, he's, right, launched, right, he's launched a, right, he's, he's created a, a biochemical weapon which is going to be released unless this person is killed within a month. I don't think the morality of Khalid argument depends very much at all, and I don't think he would say it depends very much at all on Khalid Muhammad's specific guilt and whether he specifically deserves to be roasted over an open fire or not, nor do I think that he thinks we should make these calculations when right, it's only Khalid Muhammad and not Khalid Muhammad's fourth in command who happens to be an imbecile. Right? Um, right? And, do we, and how do we make these determinations that there's some people who deserve to be roasted over an open fire for a year, other people only for six months, right? so we can torture them less? Um, and I'm, I'm, not at all, I'm not convinced that all the retribution plays a role. And I don't think that defenses of torture really, uh, really are retributive arguments at all. I think that fundamentally they are, are utilitarian arguments that the ends justify the means, and that's a reasonable argument. I think it takes thought to try and figure out why it is not true that I can sacrifice one person, however innocent, to save a million, if in fact it is true. Um, so I want to give two arguments on that end, and um, then I'll be done. Um, the first argument is um, responding to the anecdotal evidence that uh, Cloudhammer um, cites, um, right, that this in fact worked, or that it worked for, um, that it worked in, for the Israelis in the case of Nachman Waxman. Now, let's say you have a broken radio. Okay, now broken radios can sometimes be fixed by banging them repeatedly. <laughs> and each of us can give anecdotal evidence of times in which we have fixed broken radios by banging them repeatedly. Uh, but Radios also often break <laughs> by, being banged, <laughs> by being banged repeatedly. The question we have to ask is not whether it has once been the case that a radio has been fixed by being banged. The question is whether more radios are fixed <laughs> by being banged that are being broken. And the fact that the radio was fixed by being banged does not mean the radio cannot also have been fixed by having a technician call. <laughs> uh, right, so the fact that torture works in a specific case right, is not right, worth it. The fact that torture produced information in a specific case does not prove the information could not have been gotten some other way, does not tell us how many times torture fails to work, in, right, fails to work in, in, um, in, in other cases. Um, and um, what I would say is, and here I will defend quoting myself, if I can find it, <laughs> if I can, um, if I can uh, yeah, find it. Um, the ticking bomb case is always cited by advocates of torture. Um, but, um, but as the American legal proverb has it, hard cases make bad law. Um, in real life, the, the alleged terrorist would not have been tried, so we wouldn't know for sure that they were guilty. And in fact, Khalid Muhammad has not been tried. Right? Not, right? By the standards of American law, no one has any idea if he was a mastermind of 9-11 or not. And if we, right, if we right, in almost all the cases of ticking, right, ticking the bomb cases, are all cases in which there is no time for trial. Right? And one of the things, well, it's true that Jewish law endorses capital punishment. It endorses capital punishment. Um, the, the standard rabbinic opinion is right, once every seven years right, a court could execute somebody and could meet the standards, according to some rabbis. Uh, other rabbis think never. Um, other rabbis think that it's important to deter. But the standard opinion is once every seven years, perhaps. Um, secondly, um, right, secondly, most of the time, or at least right, the terrorists will respond by lying. You have no way of knowing whether the terrorist isn't broken or not. There will always be individual interrogators who believe that they know. But you have no way of knowing whether those interrogators are right or not. Um, 
But now here, here I want to make one, one important distinction. There is a difference between ethics and law. Um, right? It may very well be that in, right, in the abstract, and I, I say, and I, you know, I defend the position of Ray Soloveitchik, um, this, right, this agrees strongly. I think that the case, the case of certain knowledge and certain results is always hypothetical. You can never have certain knowledge, you can never have certain results. Um, but I'm willing to say that if, that if after the fact, right, someone came to me and said, I tortured so-and-so, as a result of torturing so-and-so, they gave me the information, which enabled me to find a nuclear bomb, right, which saved, right, which saved the people. And all these stages steps are unsure. In the, right, in the case of which the excited when the Israelis find the soldier, he dies in the attack. You never know, right, you never know what the consequences of your actions are going to be. Um, right, even in that case, they got the information, the information was accurate, still didn't yield the desired result. Um, in such a case, I might recommend promotion rather than prosecution. Um, but um, but the well, when one is making law, right, one cannot right, one cannot make law out of these out of those wild hypothetical cases. When you make law, when you decide what should be legal, you have to decide what will do the most good in the most number of cases. And I suggest that since there is at least a an equal body of, inf- of positions now, which say the torture does more harm than good, both because of the specific interrogation process and because of the um, the consequences, I, I believe that there are hundreds of American soldiers dead now because of Abu Ghraib. Um, and I think that Abu Ghraib is a natural consequence right, of the legalization of torture. Right? Not that it follows, not, not that the law permitted it, but legalizing it will inevitably lead to further abuses. Uh, so since there, are, since there is no, right, there is no professional consensus that torture ever works, or that it provides more information than otherwise, since the political consequences of torture are at best uncertain and I would say almost certainly, almost certainly tremendous, tremendously damaging. Um, since the consequences for our own, for our own democracy are on our own soldiers, right, are so likely to be spiritually damaging. Um, it seems to me that in the prudential mode of um, Jewish ethics, which is to say that we make law, all right, and we don't make judgment on cases, it's very clear that one would have to make a rig- that the law would have to be that torture is forbidden under all circumstances, that as with all laws, there are cases, right, there are always hard cases that test the law. There are always cases in which it is moral to act illegally. Um, but people have to underwrite, but those are cases which people have to take on their own responsibility. As a society, the statement has to be that the law is that torture is always forbidden. I want to thank you very much uh, for that last presentation. I think all were very interesting and exciting, and we have time for a few questions uh, directed to any of the speakers, comments, questions. Uh, so who would like to begin? Hard to imagine that no one has. Uh... Okay. Uh, yes. Who is it addressed to? Okay. Let me have, uh, I think that's probably, you'll get, if no one asks you a question, you'll have just a couple minutes concluding. I think that's a good question uh, for Rabbi Clapper, because it speaks, it's more of an opposition to what his approach was. Yeah. Um. It's a good question. Um, it's a question that I think is uh, tied up in the whole notion of what it means to imitate God. Um, right? There's a very, um, there's, a, there's a really 
interesting comedic statement which says that just as God is merciful, we should be merciful. Just as God is kind, we should be kind. Just as God buries the dead, so too we should bury the dead. All sorts of things like that. Um, the problem is that God doesn't just bury the dead, God kills the dead. Right? And God isn't, right? and God isn't just merciful, God is cruel. Um, right? All, all the actions, right? So, I think that um, at least Jewish tradition has made a very conscious effort to say that the goal of human being is not to be God. Um, and there are things that God does that we don't, that, that we say God has the right to do, and we can perhaps do when God tells us specifically to do them. Right? We can carry out certain punishments when God authorizes us to do them, but I don't think that means that everything, you know, God brings famine. Right? I don't think that justifies Stalin. Right, Stalin and starving the collectivist farmers, right, for, right, for, for a greater good. I think that using, right, using, divine action, using divine actions as our models, except when our tradition tells us specifically that these divine actions are supposed to be modeled in specific ways, um, is, um, you know, I, I would say, I would describe it as, you know, as an act of um, spiritual arrogance overall, and I, for myself it would be scary to conceive of myself as capable of doing everything God can do and having it come out right. Kelly, do you want to ask a question? Anyone else? Sorry, that wasn't huh? best yeah. question. Kelly, you have a question, and then we'll hear from the rest of us. I actually, uh, one of the major questions that I have about the Jewish Up here. Yeah, come up here. And since that's, I guess, the last question, let everybody still have to reply to Kelly, and then I know you have some comments well, on I'll, the others. And then can I'll give all the comments now, because that, that's an important, important question. Um, let's begin at the beginning. And I'll begin, uh, first of all, I want to thank both the other participants on the panel. It was a joy to, uh, to participate. It was incredibly invigorating uh, and really, really very, very fascinating discussion. Um, we can start with the epistemological point, if you want. It's not just anecdotal evidence. If you look at the Krauthammer discussion, Krauthammer notes, uses that one story about the Waxman uh, boy as an example of what the Israeli policy became after the starting of the Second Intifada, by which they themselves believe that they have prevented numerous attacks. That's what Krauthammer's point is. Krauthammer says, Yes, everyone always says that in Israel, even in Israel, where they experience terrorism at a rate that we don't experience, the high court banned terror, banned torture. And that's true. And then Klauthammer then goes on to say, yes, the high court banned torture, and then the government brought it back after the starting of the Second Intifada. When they had terrorists boarding buses and blowing up children, they found this to be an effective way of stopping it. One of the tools which has now brought all of those bus bombings effectively to an end. I remember going to Israel three years ago. There was a bombing every day. Now, there have been many different factors. I'm not saying torture is the, the magical solution that'll, that'll, that'll fix everything, if only. Um, of course that's not true. But the government has been using it to great effect. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is one American example. As I think uh, somebody who's quoting the guard, uh, Professor Casey quoted the Guardian, I think it was the Guardian itself that reported that the, the plot uncovered, not by the Bush government, of which many of the torture critics are very suspicious, but by the Blair government and by British intelligence. That was brought about, all that, that plot uncovered in London just recently, that was also uncovered through uses of coercive, uh, coercive, uh, mean. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the administration claims that it's prevented, helped to prevent numerous attacks. If you don't want to believe them, I do believe them. I do believe they actually care about procuring our safety first and foremost. But if you don't want to believe that administration, we have another case in England. Now, of course torture doesn't always work. Of course it doesn't. Will sometimes people lie? Of course they will. Will mistakes be made? Perhaps mistakes will be made too. But let's take war as a parallel. War is a very good example. Let's say we think we know where certain terrorists are hiding in Afghanistan. And they want to target it with, the, the, the US military wants to target 
the terrorist base with missiles and blow it up. In Afghanistan, okay? Is this something that most people in the United States would support? Absolutely. Now, is it possible? Has there been a trial for those people? An American-style trial with cross-examination? No. But assuming they're guilty, and we think they are, do they deserve getting the missile, getting uh, hellfire rained down on them from above? Not by God with Sodom, but rather through our missiles? Of course they do. Is it also... But is that, can that be spiritually damaging to a soldier? Engaging in war, engaging in acts of killing? Of course. Is killing an act that its consequences... Now, suppose the missile, as has happened, suppose the missile instead ends up killing innocent people, right? Bill Clinton, when it came to Al-Qaeda, tried to kill Osama bin Laden, right? Hit a factory. Possibly less of the janitor was killed. Is that a tremendous tragedy? Is that one life of infinite value? Of course it is. But does that mean, because we're worried about the state of our souls, that we don't engage in acts of killing without trial sometimes, based on the intelligence that we think we have? Of course we do. Now, is killing somebody more, uh, uh, killing an innocent person worse than temporarily inflicting great pain? The story that Ray Clapper cited about uh, death was worse than pain was, somebody who was, was about somebody who was dying. Of course somebody could say if somebody is dying that this, he wants his life to end. But that's not the torture we're talking about. Waterboarding, and I'm not saying it's not torture. I think the Bush administration is wrong to say, oh, this is not torture. They should say it is torture, and we're proud to do things in defense of our country. I think that would have been a better electoral strategy than this one. I do. No one would have stood in the ballot box and said, no one would have stood in the ballot box and said, well, so Andrew Sullivan would, but, uh, but uh, no one would have stood in the ballot box and said, Bush will torture terrorists in order to save my children? I'm voting Democrat. No one would have said that. I, I certainly would have. When Andrew Sullivan wrote on his blog that a vote for Republicans is a vote for torture, I was like, ooh, okay. Um, is that a commercial? Not because I believe in torture all the time, but because it has its place. So, all of these arguments, all of these arguments, arguments that it can hurt our souls, arguments that sometimes it hurts innocent people, based on these things, forget about torture. Torture is only a, a, a temporarily terrible thing done to an innocent person if it's done to an innocent person. But innocent people are killed in wars. They're killed permanently. We should ban all wars. We should never shoot any missiles at terrorists in Afghanistan because innocent people could be killed and not only, even if innocent people aren't killed, the souls of the soldiers will be inevitably sullied by that action. The same argument can be made, only much better in that case. So epistemology, of course, is an issue, as it is an issue with everything. But when it comes to acting to prevent harm to innocence, we do the best we can. Unless we truly believe that because it sullies our souls, a human being can never engage in violence. And Professor Casey is certainly right to know that there are certain statements in Christian tradition. If you do away with a lot of Paul, if you don't focus on Paul's statements, but on Jesus' statements, it seems quite pacifistic. And Stanley Horowitz has created a whole school of thought based on that. Now the, perhaps the most influential ethicist in America is a pacifist. So if you're a pacifist, I don't think we have much to talk about. That's true. But then you're not only against capital punishment, you're against war. You're against shooting missiles in Afghanistan. So that's how I would approach the epistemology question. Having said that, uh, let me address uh, uh, one other issue which I think really gets to the, to the core of our disagreement, and that was the story with which you began, the story of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva, yes, is by a cruel, evil regime, the Roman regime, Rabbi Akiva was tortured to death. Does that mean that torture is always wrong? As I understand the argument that was put forward, the argument was, well, from a matter of strict justice, we all deserve to be tortured. And Rabbi Akiva deserves to be tortured. Maybe Rabbi Deathler said that, but I think I could never say that and I can't accept it. Okay. What bothers me about the modern Catholic approach that I was talking about is that I see the same idea. So maybe 
There's more connection to Christian to Christian you know, than than one would think. Let's take Mother Teresa. Suppose somebody flayed Mother Teresa's skin with iron combs. Would would somebody say that from a perspective of strict justice, she deserved that? Maybe she would say that, but I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that it's only because of mercy, because of God's mercy, that she doesn't deserve. Rabbi Kiva was tortured. Yes. Did he deserve to be tortured? No. Why did God allow him to be tortured? I don't know. But not because he deserved it. And when little children die in the world, it's also not because they deserve it. Why do they die of terrible sicknesses sometimes? I don't know. Is is from a matter of forget mercy for a moment. From a pattern, from a from a perspective of strict justice, are Rabbi Akiva and Hitler the same? Do they equally deserve to be tortured? I could never say such a thing. And that's what bothers me when I see modern... So what bothers me about your statement is what bothers me a lot about modern, even very conservative Catholic discussions about hell. Richard John Newhouse, the man who, whose writings I like very much, when he argued for the concept that we can truly hope that no one is in hell at all. Um, so he says, well, what about Hitler? Maybe Hitler, shouldn't Hitler at least be eternally damned? So he says, no. He said, well, maybe Hitler had a thousand of years in purgatory, and, now, and then he goes to heaven. Or maybe, he said, Hitler is just like a little dog in heaven to whom we all condescend, but he's very happy to be there, even though he doesn't deserve it, just as we are all happy to be there, even though we don't deserve to be there. If you believe that, if you believe that all human beings are inherently evil in some way, that they all deserve that they're all in some sense, at least from the perspective of God's justice, leaving out his rachim and his mercy, that they all deserve this, then yes, perhaps something, you could disagree with some things I said. But it's precisely because I don't believe that that, 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 that I'm saying what I'm saying. Precisely because I believe that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and, and, and other mass murderers are inherently and morally, from God's perspective of justice and from of justice, much worse and deserve much more punishment. That's why I think torture can be a just approach when there's a, 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 a when there's a social need. Thank you. Now, this obviously is going to be continue to be in the news, and I want to thank all of you so much for a very intellectually exciting and informative evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>